Hello everybody um, and welcome to CRHT's webinar on understanding our approach to revising manual for streets. My name is Andrew Hugill, I'm the Director of Policy and Technical Affairs um, at CIHT and I'm going to be the host for today's webinar. Um, what we're aiming to do today is explain where we're at with manual for streets. It's obviously um, something that's of great interest to a lot of people. Um, we've got almost 300 people online, um, which is great to have you all here. Um, and so we want to just explain what's happening with manual for streets and what we're aiming to do over the next um, couple of years um, and how importantly you can get involved in that um, because it is something that we need um, quite a lot of people to be involved in in different roles. Um, so before we start I'd like to introduce um, Sally Gibbons and Peter Dickinson if they'd like to join me with their webcams if they're able to do that. Hi Peter, hi Sally, you both okay? Hello, yes we're fine. Hello, yes. Hello, everybody. Good, your microphones are working. Um, so, in a moment, we're going to have um, a video presentation by Peter and Sally, um, where Peter will give an introduction to um, Manual for Streets. Um, Sally will then talk about um, Manual for Streets from the Department of Transport's perspective um, and why it's important that um, manual, manual for Streets is updated. Um, and then Peter will finish off with um, an overview of the project moving forwards. And then we will have um, quite a bit of time for questions and answers. Um, so in terms of questions and answers, we'd like to do the majority of questions by written questions. So as the video presentation is playing, which I'll start in a moment or so, please do answer questions or ask questions via the questions box. Um, and then we can collate answers together and pick them up with Peter and Sally after the presentation has finished. Um, so by way of introduction, um, Sally Gibbons is the Head of Traffic Signs and Street Design Policy at the Department for Transport. She is also um, a CR member of CIHT um, and has done a lot of work with us over the years. So welcome, Sally. Um, and Peter Dickens, Peter Dickinson is, has been leading from a member perspective on CIHT's approach to urban design for many years as chair of our urban design panel and has been involved in a lot of the work that we've been doing around urban design. Um, and we've asked Peter to chair the project board for this project, which he'll explain in a moment. So again, welcome Peter. Um, so that's the three of us. Um, before we start the, the video presentation, we'd like to do um, a couple of polls just to understand a bit about you who are online. Um, so I'll put a poll up, um, which you know, and you're then able to answer it. So the first one um, is just about why you're interested in this video uh, webinar about updating the manual for streets. Um, so I'm just launching that now. Um, and you should be able to tick one of those responses if you wouldn't mind. Um, so please go ahead and do that. We'll leave it open for um, as many of you as possible to, to vote. Don't worry if you for some reason can't vote. It's not, we're not gonna um, make any decisions based on this. It's just a, a useful sort of um, indication for us. So at the moment, I use it frequently in my work is the, the one that's coming out the, the most. Um, there's um, a sizable proportion about my organization uses it and I need to understand it. Um, I'm aware of manual for streets and interested in what's happening to it. Um, and there's uh, only 4% of you at the moment that manual for streets is new to me. So um, um, that's coming up. And Stuart's asked the question, just saying he uses the Scottish equivalent, designing streets. So thanks for that, Stuart. Um, We've got 88% voted. So what I'll do now is close that and we'll just share that with everybody. So yeah, so a lot of you um, are using it frequently. Um, a quite significant proportion of you, uh, your organization uses it. You need to understand the changes and um, equally you're interested in the changes and you're aware of it. Or there's a small percentage of you new to you. So welcome to, um, a, a topic that's kept many of us um, 
and busy for a long time around manual for streets. So we'll hide that one. And then we'll just ask you another one, which is just to describe your um, current job role. So which of the following best describes your current job, job role? Um, so there's a choice of five. If you're not covered in that, apologies. Um, again, this is not completely scientific, but just useful to understand. So transport planners and highway engineers out in front, which you might expect at the moment. Um, local government officers well represented, um, two percent as urban designers interested, and nobody that's a developer, which is interesting because that's a key target area for the manual for streets and the revision. So we need to do more work around that, obviously. Um, okay, so we've got well over eighty percent have voted now. So um, let's close that down and then we'll share the results of that one so as you can see it dominated by highway engineers and transport planners um, with a, a hefty percentage of local government um, officers as well um, quite a small percentage of urban designers and no developers which as i say we need to address that in making sure we've got the development side organized as we move through this project Okay, so I'll hide that one now. So what we're gonna do now is play a pre-recorded um, um, video. It lasts about 22 minutes. It's got Peter first and at the end with Sally in the middle. So I'll play that now. So I can ask um, Peter and Sally to remove their cameras and I'll remove mine as well. Um, and just to say that um, all of this is being recorded and will be available um, on the CIHT website to um, everybody afterwards, um, probably in a day or so. So um, there's no need to take copious notes of the slides. They will be available later on. So um, I'll just disappear and we'll play the video. Well, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Peter Dickinson. I'm going to give you a little bit of uh, background to why we're here this afternoon and uh, hopefully give you a little bit of context at the same time. Here's the original Manual for Streets document. Um, it was uh, published in 2007 by the uh, Department for Transport and it was described as being applicable for the design of lightly trafficked residential streets. Um, interestingly, it contained a reference to those key principles being applicable to other types of streets, uh, of which a little more later on. But importantly, it introduced the concept of sustainable street design and particularly uh, in respect of the importance of place as well as uh, uh, as well as movement so that balance between place and movement and it also uh, mentioned and emphasized the importance of the link between planning and street design uh, and in that respect uh, extolled the virtues uh, and recommended uh, coordinated decision making so that was in 2007 then along came what became known as Manual for Streets 2. Significantly, it was subtitled Wider Application of the Principles, and that alluded to that reference in the original document that those principles did have that wider application. It was published uh, in 2010 by uh, CIHT, and it was described as a companion guide to Manual for Streets. So it was not a replacement, uh, it wasn't an updating per se, but it was very much seen as a, as, as a, as a companion. Uh, and in that respect, it was a companion which allowed designers to apply those wider principles to busier streets and to the non-trunk network. Um, and I suppose in that respect, it was seen as a, an opportunity to uh, fill that gap in terms of street design 
uh, between the original manual for streets and the design manual for road and bridges. Um, so we had two design guides um, published three years apart, uh, one published by the department and the other by the institution. Um, and the notion was that they would cover the design of all roads below the DMRB hierarchy. Um, the intention was that they would be used by all built environment professionals, but particularly uh, for everyone involved in street design and maintenance and indeed the management thereof. Um, and that was that. However, they didn't become comprehensively adopted and we've heard evidence recently that they still are not comprehensively utilised um, and that's a concern. Um, in fact it's a concern to such an extent when you hear uh, anecdotal and then confirmed stories about people still using Design Bulletin 32 would you believe? The concepts therein were I suppose uh, conceived half a century ago and people are apparently still using DMRB for some of these 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 applications and that isn't in itself very good. Um, in addition um, there were clear gaps in the guidance in those two documents um, particularly around the application on the rural road network um, and in some respects in terms of, of visibility. So. Whilst we have these two documents in place, they're not comprehensively used. Um, there are some gaps that require addressing and clearly in the intervening period since the original publication in 2007, times have changed. So the questions we asked ourselves were, how do we address those issues? And um, to that end, we've had uh, extensive discussions with both the department and the uh, and the Ministry and I'm pleased to say that the revision of Manual for Streets is uh, now a real prospect. Um, so that I hope uh, ladies and gentlemen gives you some idea of why we're here this afternoon. Um, Sally is going to elaborate I think on the perspective from the department's view. Thank you very much for now. Hello. My name is Sally Gibbons and I am Head of Traffic Signs and Street Design Policy at the Department for Transport. My team is responsible for the Manual for Streets and for the project to update it. And in my part of this webinar today, I'm going to cover why we are updating it, what we've done so far and some of our thinking behind it. As Peter said in his previous presentation, Manual for Streets was published in 2007 and represented a radical change of approach to residential street design. Manual for Streets 2, published in 2010, extended these ideas to busier streets, such as high streets. We know that Manual for Streets and the principles within it works. This is an extract from the Housing Design Audit for England, carried out by the Place Alliance and University College London, which audited and evaluated the design of uh, 142 large-scale housing developments across the country and scored them on various criteria and design considerations. Um, what it found was that high scoring, good developments, were much more likely to have been designed using Manual for Streets principles, almost two and a half times more likely. Others also see the importance of Manual for Streets. The Building Better, Building Beautiful Commission made this recommendation in its report published in January this year, that, that, that there is an important need to update and improve the government's guidance on street design. The government's considering this, its response to this report at the moment, um, and I am not sure how we more firmly withdraw Design Bulletin 32, but we will give it a try. We certainly agree that no one should be using it to design anything anymore. So it's clear that a manual for streets is important as it is and does, and does deliver good street design. But why does it need updating? Well, for many reasons. Uh, for starters, it's 13 years old. It was, uh, it was published in 2007. And in that time, a lot has changed. The planning regime has changed. The national planning policy framework needs to be reflected in Manual for Streets, given the manual's role in residential developments. Second, Manual for Streets is not as widely used as, as we would like to see. Some are still using the Design Manual for Roads and Bridges and the aforementioned DB32. There is still a lot of poor development going in, unfortunately. 
this headline on the slide is from a BBC story about the Transport for New Homes report, which found that too much development was being designed to lock in car use and not giving residents real choice about how they moved around. And MFS stretches across many other policy areas, many of which have changed significantly in the last 13 years, and it needs updating to reflect the latest uh, thinking in those areas. The future of mobility is also part of this of this discussion because um, the future, future of streets is going to need to accommodate all sorts of things that we are only just beginning to understand, such as automated vehicles, connected vehicles, electric vehicles and their charge points, uh, micro mobility and electric scooters and uh, many other issues besides. Um, in the future of mobility urban strategy last year, we said that we would uh, undertake a scoping study to inform an update to the manual for streets. Obviously, these new and exciting futuristic things have to be considered alongside more traditional street design and how we accommodate the needs of everybody. And the current situation has also brought a new focus to street design. Um, during the COVID-19 crisis, lockdown has been hard for everybody, but there have been some unexpected side effects around active travel and improved air quality. Um, and there's definitely been a push from government and from many others to maintain those benefits, some of those unexpected benefits to uh, maintain increased levels of cycling and walking. Um, and to help with this, government announced a two billion pound package of funds to create uh, new cycling infrastructure back in May. And that included uh, money for emergency active travel measures such as pop up cycle lanes and widening pavements to enable social distancing as people move around. There have also been uh, more recent announcements around summer streets and about uh, encouraging uh, local authorities to give over road space to cafes and restaurants and encouraging businesses to put tables and chairs on the pavement, uh, appropriately licensed, of course, and done in a way that doesn't create an obstruction so that they can operate in a socially distant way. Um, all of this uh, is aimed at creating the economic benefits that good street design can provide. Um, Well-designed streets contribute to these aims and um, MFS, an, an updated MFS needs to be a part of this as we look to the future and try and lock in some of those um, benefits to a new normal. So we carried out the scoping study. Um, we commissioned the Cabinet Office's Policy Lab last year. Um, they use uh, user-centred design approaches and agile project approaches, which some of you may be familiar with. Um, to really kind of drill down into the whys and wherefores of issues. And it was a very interesting process. They, they, we asked them to look at several questions. You know, do we need MFS? Go back to basics. Who uses it? But most importantly, perhaps who doesn't use it and why not? And what changes could we make to make, to make sure they did use it? The project included immersive research, which uh, involved the researchers going out to practitioners um, <laughs> in their working environments and in their offices and talking to them about what documents they used, how they used them and why. Um, it also included an all day stakeholder event, um, which CIHT kindly hosted and which got people from many different disciplines thinking about what a new MFS should look like and include discussing, drawing. Um, it was an animated and very interesting day. So um, after that stakeholder event, the policy lab went away and collated uh, all the evidence that they'd, they'd uh, collected and produced um, uh, a long list of recommendations, which we received last summer. Um, luckily, the primary recommendation was that, yes, we still need MFS. Um, but there were also recommendations around content, who it should be aimed at, what it should look like and so on. Uh, some of the major recommendations I've listed here, uh, including that uh, it should be clearly branded DFT slash CLG but possibly even uh, HM government, um, that it should align with planning policy, um, that it should be designed with the input of users, which I suppose is a fundamental point of street design generally, not just the advice on street design, um, and that it should be freely available. There were some interesting views that came out of the research, um, some people which just showed the breadth of views that people have on this. Uh, some people said it should be online only. Some people said it still had to be hard copy. Some said it should be more prescriptive, some it was about right, but there was an overall agreement that it was needed and it should be updated regularly and freely available to all. So we, uh, we considered those recommendations and uh, began to think about how we took those forward into updating the manual properly. Um, unfortunately, we had a few hiatuses um, due to things like the general election 
and the current coronavirus situation, which has stretched resources for everybody. Um, but now we're moving on and working with CIHT to deliver an updated manual, um, picking up those recommendations from the policy lab. We've chosen CIHT for several reasons. Um, they are one of the preeminent voices of highways professionals in this field. They have access to a whole range of expertise, uh, many people who've been involved in this world for a long time. They've been, they have access also to the people who use the manual and can help us kind of work out uh, whether we're on the right lines. They've been involved with Manual for Streets before um, and with street design generally for a long time. And not least, they are the publishers of MFS2, which is one of the documents we need to update. Uh, who's involved. There are a lot of interested parties in this project um, because good street design is so fundamental and so wide ranging and so impactful on so many things. A lot of people want to be involved. One of the most important sectors for us is uh, accessibility groups and making sure that those voices are heard. <clears throat> in recent years, improving access to transport, including public realm, has become a focus for the department and um, making sure our design advice enables good, accessible, inclusive street design to be delivered is really important. We also have interest from the public health sector because good street design encourages active travel, also uh, which uh, improves physical health, but also mental health. Being in a, in a pleasant environment is, is good for your brain. Um, we have interest from developers who obviously are key to getting good residential development built. From the planning inspectorates who are incredibly important in making sure bad development doesn't go forward. Um, and of course, MHCLG, who are the custodians of the planning system and are therefore key to getting MFS embedded in that for new developments. We're also working with them um, to look at the National Planning Policy Guidance, the National Design Guide and the National Model Design Code. Um, it, so it's safe to say there is a lot of uh, link, uh, link up there with, with the, the planning side. We need to, you know, there's, there's a huge range of people who want to get involved and who we want to involve. And we, we need to think very carefully about how we do that um, and to what level as we get going. So finally, we've now got to the point of getting going with the work to bring together, review and update both manuals, which is great. Um, I will let Peter tell you uh, a little bit more about that process and how you can be involved um, in his next presentation. Thank you very much for listening. OK, well, thank you very much, Sally. Um, Back to me now, and I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about uh, in a little bit of detail. So you've heard the background, why we're doing it, why does the FT have a view that it's uh, necessary to carry out a revision, uh, and you've heard that CIHT has been asked to manage the project. So as I say, a little more detail about the project. What will it look like? It'll be a government document published by government, um, but clearly CIHT will have an appropriate uh, acknowledgement. Uh, within it. It'll be available as an online guidance document um, via the .gov.uk website. Um, the first part will be made available in hard copy as well and the idea of that is to disseminate the first part, um, the, the, the generic stuff uh, more widely and the second part will be an online resource and uh, as I say uh, we could consider updating that on a regular basis, whether it be annual or not, remains to be seen on the dependent upon the need. Uh, clearly, there's going to be need for engagement with, with uh, a number of key groups, but particularly the planning inspectorate, whose role in implementing uh, guidance of this nature is clearly crucial. And of course, there will be a uh, significant and focused uh, communications campaign uh, to promote the document. There was much discussion uh, in the past about the uh, relevance of local plans and the intention at this stage is to produce a separate document as part of the project um, to include specifically within local plans for obvious reasons um, and for equally obvious reasons we're looking to carry out quite an extensive stakeholder engagement strategy uh, as part of the implementation phase. Um, other, the other administrations, the devolved administrations, do have not dissimilar guidance at the moment, 
um, and we will uh, we will involve those devolved administrations in the preparation of this document um, and obviously the status of it in its final form uh, will be subject to discussion at the time um, and as I've already implied there will be uh, significant ongoing training across the entire sector. So that's our tentative uh, plan about what the thing will look like. Um, uh, how is it going to be managed? Well, um, here we are in very broad terms. The, 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 uh, the, the blue box indicates the areas of responsibility that, that, are, that are the CIHTs. Um, the project reports through to uh, the senior responsible officer in the Department of Transport from the CIHT steering group, high level steering group within the, within the institution. Uh, to which reports a project board managing, responsible for managing the delivery of the project and I've been asked if I will chair that board which I'm very honoured and happy to do and it is to that board that the consultant uh, will report. Um, we say consultancy team because at this stage it's not entirely clear how that consultancy uh, operation is going to be structured but however it's structured the reporting process and route will be directed to the project board. Sitting to the left hand side on the slide you see a stakeholder group that's a, an industry, H&T sector, CIHT orientated stakeholder group um, who will have a, a significant consultative uh, input into the work the consultants carry out. Uh, and on the right you see a sounding board uh, outside of the CIHT box there's some discussion ongoing and, and the, 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 the mechanism by means of which that sounding board is to be managed will, uh, will, will take shape as the project develops but uh, we see that sounding board as a, as a collection of uh, the external stakeholders of which you will appreciate there are a, quite a significant uh, number um, uh, to be involved. So that's uh, in very broad terms how the project is going to be structured. Uh, the consultant will have a degree of responsibility for the uh, project that is not to be underestimated. Um, as I've said the, it, it will be a specific competitive commission for the work appointed by the institution and their role is to provide a consistent approach to management of the project and to uh, coordinate and develop and manage uh, the collection and collation and presentation uh, of, the, of the content for the guidance document. We expect that the content will be gained and gleaned from a number of sources, um, some of which, and this is by no means an exclusive list, uh, some of which uh, are, are set out here and we would expect the consultant to have a, uh, an approach which uh, led to a, a, a wide source of, um, of, uh, of, of content from, as I say, these organisations and uh, as well as others. Um, so that's what we expect the consultant to do, whoever he, he or she is. The timescales are uh, pretty tight. Uh, we're now in the middle of July and we expect that we will invite expressions of interest following this event, um, probably formally open that, that, that opportunity uh, on the 1st of August or thereabouts. Um, we'll give people a month to express that interest and then give some thought to what we've, uh, with the expressions of interest that we've received. And then uh, on the basis of those expressions of interest, we'll invite tender submissions. Um, um, from the middle of September, we anticipate through to the end of October, with, uh, the, with the intention of appointing a consultant during November. Um, and then the, uh, the consultant's work will, will proceed in, co in, in conjunction with the project board, as I've said. And very tentatively, we would look towards publication of the document um, in the way I've described in the early part of 2022. Um, I should emphasize all of these dates, perhaps with the exception of the first one, are pretty tentative but and possibly a little aspirational, but um, 
but why not be aspirational? So that's the plan. Um, I hope that's all clear. Um, and I hope it gives you at least a taste for what it is that we're, uh, we're expecting and planning to do. Um, but I'm sure that there are a number of questions. So uh, Andrew, I think, is going to coordinate the way in which we respond to those questions. So thank you very much for your attention so far. Thank you. Hello, right, it's Andrew back again, and perhaps if Peter and Sally could join me, we can start picking up some of the um, questions. So um, let's just get the screen up. Um, right, so Sally's there and Peter's there. Right, okay, so hopefully that um, was a relatively quick go through what's quite a complicated area. And we've had lots of questions in already. Um, so where to start then? Um, I think there was a query which hopefully has been answered now from um, Costas, which was about um, how we were going to um, do this work. Um, is it going to be active members of CIHT or as an external consultant to be awarded a contract? Um, it's, it's, it's definitely the latter. Um, we're very clear there's a lot of work that needs to be done in here and whilst we value the work of our, our volunteers etc in developing guidelines for us um, we took the view it does need to be a properly resourced um, consultancy project that will be managed in the way that Peter set out in the video so um, what, what probably didn't come across is that we've with CIST made a submission to the department which has been accepted for funding to do that work. Um, so that is in place now for the um, the sort of, if, if you like, the first two phases, the, um, the preparation of the um, brief and the appointment of the consultant and the doing of the work, which is what Peter outlined. So hopefully that makes that very clear. Um, and, and in the next um, few months, the appointment of that consultant will be the key focus for the for the project team, as well as getting together the um, stakeholder groups and the sounding boards, because that's going to be vital to the success of the project as well. So hopefully that's clear. Um, Sally, Peter, anything you wanted to add around that that sort of area? No. Okay, that's fine. Okay, there was then quite a few um, sort of comments um, around what might be in um, Manual for Streets. Um, and probably some of these um, um, we can be quite specific on, others perhaps more general on. Um, there was a couple from Stephen and from who else? Um, from Peter Taylor about the whole issues around visibility and speed analysis, which is obviously a key point um, in there. I mean, I'll give my point of view and then um, perhaps Sally and, um, and Peter could come in. Um, I guess the overall answer is yes, um, and there's particularly around visibility. We've been fortunate in that we we always envisage there needs to be more work and research done, uh, i.e. primary research around visibility, because the um, both the departments and CIHT, as and I'm sure as many of you are aware, is this this sort of grey area between DMRV and manual for streets and and how visibility. Um, works in that. So we've been fortunate as as well as the money that um, DFT are able to give us for developing manual for streets. We've also been awarded a grant for to do some research into visibility. Um, and it's very fortunate that's happened in, in the same time scale. So some of you may have picked up there's actually a separate webinar on Friday lunchtime that's talking about that visibility project. And again, we'd be seeking to um, appoint a consultant for that one. Um, we wanted to keep the two separate, even though they're probably quite clearly interlinked, um, but the timing is good for that. So to answer those questions around speed and visibility, um, I think the broad answer is yes. I don't know, Sally or Peter, do you want to add anything to what I've said there? Uh, no, I think the, the I think I acknowledge the fact that there was gaps in the existing guidance, and it is some of those gaps that we're seeking to address. And certainly, 
the fact that we've got these two projects in parallel, one of which relates specifically to visibility, means we can plug whatever comes out of that project into the into the guidance document at the end of the day. And that's uh, <coughs> excuse me, that's definitely the plan. Yeah. Ali, anything to add? Yeah. Um, no, I mean it's exactly right. We've always known those gaps in uh, in uh, in MFS as regards visibility, so it's good to be able to plug those gaps um, in the in the new version. Um, I don't know if this is where we, you know in regard to DMRB. Do we want to pick up some of the move on to some of the questions about how it relates because it's it does tend to overlap or not yeah. as the case with me. <laughs> do you want to move into that area then, Sally? Um, yes, I can do. Let me just Let me see the questions. Yeah, um, there's a, was a question somewhere about uh sort of basically how there's a few questions about how the two how mfs and dmrb relate and whether you know mfs is going to fall into line with dmrb and so on um and i think this is one of the the issues is that dmrb as i said in my presentation is being used for roads where it's really not appropriate so what i you know what i would like to do is get highways england to refer to manual for streets for low speed roads um so that people are you know pointed towards the right guidance um, we have, we, so we, we need to kind of try and pursue those conversations. But, um, but you know, if you're, if it, DMRB also has been revised uh, completely um, over the last few years and has been published, I think the final versions were published sort of earlier this year, and it doesn't have the same application to local roads that it used to. So that's, so so that status of it has changed too. And I think there's a there's an opportunity there to sort of um, to make sure that the people are following the right guidance for the right kind of road. Peter, anything to add to that? Um, no, I don't think so. I think uh, we're moving on to questions about what the status of the document is going to be, because I think that's part and parcel of the reason why some organisations uh, have, have veered back towards DMR being inappropriate. Mm. And I think uh, there are some questions I see about about status and um, I. Whilst whilst I did say that it was going to be a government-led document, I think my the reason I said that is because during the policy lab work there was much debate and discussion about why the the, the existing documents weren't weren't universally accepted, and that debate tended to focus in on on the status of the document. And so I think there's going to be a continuing discussion about how we strengthen the status of the document. Um, and mm. one of the ways of doing that is to make it a government-led document rather than a than just a department or indeed as an institution document. So I think all of that is sort of wrapped up in the same way. But, you, but Sally's right. If 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 Highways England do emphasize that uh, the, the, the 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 restrictions or the limits of DMRB, then that will go a long way towards helping to people to understand what the distinction is. Mm. Um, and the other thing I'd, I'd say is I think I mentioned it in my presentation is that. We're working with MHCLG, Ministry of Housing, Communities and Local Government, to, see, to sort of try and work out how to get this into the, to get this linked to the national planning policy framework and the national planning policy guidance. Um, because for, res, for new residential developments in the planning system, that again gives it a bit, you know, uh, helps with the status of it um, as regards what should be used for new developments. Obviously, it doesn't help the kind of the, the, the retrofit high streets and, and other schemes that don't get involved in the planning system, but you know, there's other ways we can try and boost the status of the document, um, as Peter said, through you know sort of stronger branding and uh, and partly it's about training and dissemination as well. I think um, it was. Uh, sorry, sorry. Peter. I was just going to say, and the fact that we have embraced the ministry in all of our recent discussions, and that that, that and that has been a very positive interaction. I think is very hopeful in terms of addressing the. Good those those challenges and problems from the past yeah and I, I just think to to add to what Peter and Sally have said I, I think the policy work was um, Sally sort of summarized the recommendations but there was a lot of recommendations um, around making sure that highways England were involved mm. but Peter talked about two parts to manual for streets and the first part was that um, that would be done in hard form and, and, and circulated widely was very much a, a very clear statement of where Manual for Streets sat in the, the hierarchy of um, design and planning documentation, if I can put it that way, to emphasise 
how important it was. And so that in itself is, I, I feel, a sort of really strong part of the work that the Cabinet Office did. Um, and in the um, in the briefing document that will go out to interested consultancies and others, um, the recommendations will be will be set out in there. So it'll be quite clear about about what needs to be done um, to that regard. Okay, shall we move on to a sort of another area, which was uh, I think generally and, and sorry if I I sort of lumped several things together. It's about the sort of things that might be included in um, in manual for streets and also how they might be included. So there was um, a couple of comments and questions around greater emphasis on cycling and walking and acceptable cycle design from, I think, Andrew Fisher. Um, there was then a comment about summer streets and should their use be extended and how would manual for streets deal with that? And then there was a wider question that somebody asked about how um, those sort of comments could be got into both the design of the new manual for streets and then also in the updating of the manual for streets as it continues so peter sally any particular comments in terms of content and how content gets arrived at uh well i can, I can yeah have a go um the, the the first one about the cycling walking and acceptable cycling design um, there is the, the long-awaited local transport notes, which is an update of cycle infrastructure design, which will have a lot more about um, <coughs> uh, acceptable cycling infrastructure design within it. It's we're, it, published shortly, as best I can say at the moment, but, um, but that's probably going to be the place for that kind of level of detail, notwithstanding that MFS obviously has a, has a, a, um, a key role to play in emphasising you know, the, the, the hierarchy of, of provision and, and w which groups of road users you, you prioritise. Um, so obviously that, that, that is a, a key part of that. Um, I've gone blank, I can't remember the, the next <laughs> piece of you want to pick up. <laughs> is around, so I guess, the um, sort of in terms of content from, so if members um, were sort of, how do they get content in there basically, I guess, and check that it is. And I, I suppose what I was going to say was that that is the reason for the stakeholder group yeah, to make absolutely. sure that that's the route for people who are not sort of directly involved in the consultancy work um, yeah. can feed in what, what yeah. they feel should be in there and what should be covered. Um, yeah, and that was a strong reason for having that stakeholder group. So um, one of the reasons yeah. for today is to start to find who that stakeholder group should be. So hopefully a lot of you out there, um, if you're not going to be part of a consultancy that, that eventually gets the, the, the sort of um, the award of the contract, that actually there is an ability to feed in around content, et cetera. Peter, anything to add around that area? Uh, well, only to emphasize that we, I think we'd like as much input from people who are both interested, aware, and, and, and can contribute in a positive way as is possible. And there was a question from somebody, it might have been Glenn, I think, about will it be a single single consultant or will, will it be a submissions from a series of consultants? I think uh, I think it will be the former. Um, I'm pretty sure about that. I, I don't think that the institution wants to be involved with the management of a series of separate consultants. I think we'll be looking for a, for a figurehead, uh, for want of a better phrase. Um, but there will be an opportunity for other people who, who as I say, have a, have a remit or an interest to contribute through that, that that stakeholder group that I showed in that on the left hand side of that slide. Now, that could be a huge number of people, and I can't say that I've got it clear in my mind at the moment about how we might manage that. But clearly, we want to take that opportunity as best we can. And I think for people who want to be involved, then the way to do it is to express that interest, and then we'll work out how we how we include you. Whether we end up with with events of this nature or whether we're all able to get together again remains to be seen but uh, I think that's the way I would see it in a general sense. And I think um, I think to add to that the only slight note of caution I'd sound is that we have had an awful lot of interest from an awful lot of sectors and groups and people wanting to <laughs> sorry wanting to uh, or seeing manual for streets as, as, a, as a, um, a, a good way to address various concerns which of course it is and there's, as I said there's a wide range of interests here we just need to make sure that manual for streets doesn't become a Christmas tree that everything is hung on um, and that uh, that we, we sort of make sure we cover the right things in the right way um, 
so we, there, so there is a sort of as well as it's, it's how we manage all the interests and make sure that the right things are included yeah i think that there was a question and apologies because i can't reference it directly now but there was a question about um how it is updated once so clearly at, at a point it will be the new manual for streets will be produced uh, and peter talked about um a, a sort of updating process I, I think that's it's it's part of the proposal that we put into the department which um we haven't sort of confirmed yet um and, and hopefully we'll do so as as this phase of the project develops is that ongoing support to manual for streets to recognize that it 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 will need to update over time um, and also the training part of that too will will need to take a period <laughs> beyond the period we've talked about so um clearly sally you won't be in a position to commit to that now but that but that's part of the discussion ongoing discussions through this phase of the project isn't it yep um it is definitely and i think in terms of updating i think the idea of having a sort of a core document and then lots of and then you know other annexes to follow helps with some of with some of those questions i think is you know perhaps a, a, a vehicle to be able to update various bits more easily rather than the whole document um so it is you know definitely as with much of the stuff we produce how how do you keep it up to date and relevant and something we, we very much need to be addressing as we go through yeah okay there's a couple of areas um and there's some really useful comments in, in the questions. So thank you to everybody. Um, what we'll do, we, we, we won't have time today to answer everything in, in the detail it probably deserves, but um, what we will do is, is produce um, a summary of those questions um, with sort of answers and, and pointers. Some of the, them we won't be able to answer now. I, I, I can tell you that now to, to some people, but they will be taken into account as we develop the um, discussion. Um, there's, a, there's a couple of areas, questions around the, the shared space um, and, um, and will it, how will it reference to work that CRHT has done um, around that, et cetera, and um, reallocating carriageway to active modes. So any thoughts on that, Sally, at the moment? I think to take shared space first, I think definitely accessibility, accessible public realm is incredibly important, an incredibly important issue that we need to make sure we get right in, in, in all of our guidance. Um, and I think it needs, I think we need to be thinking more widely than than shared space, the, the, whatever you choose to, to describe shared space as, and think about embedding accessible design completely within um, within the way that uh, that streets are designed, because you know, uh, shared space, although it's very high profile, is still probably only quite a small percentage of the road network as a whole. Um, so Accessibility is one of those key things that, that we need to think about when we're um, updating the content. And as I said, we are going to be talking to DIPDAC and other groups about how we can make sure that we um, that we take that on board. There is research underway um, uh, with uh, Transport Scotland are leading, which is due to report soon. We will consider whether any of those recommendations are relevant to manual for streets. Um, and there's also other parallel work going on in the department to update inclusive mobility. Um, and so on. So there's there's all these these things that link together in some way, and making sure we keep those links and is 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 important. Um, active travel has become uh, certainly very recently, it, again a very very um, important and, and high profile way of trying to sort of make sure we it, the questions about how we sort of keep the unexpected side effects of of, uh, of the current situation. Um, and there's a lot of work going on in the department about that. Um, so I would expect. I mean, it's in line. It's kind of in line with what Manual for Streets already said, in terms of you know prioritising walking and cycling in low-speed roads and so on. So it's sort of giving that a bit of a boost, more of a reason to do this, if if I can put it that way. Um, and uh, as I mentioned before, the forthcoming guidance on cycle infrastructure design will help to really set out what is considered you know good practice in that area. Uh, anything else to add, anybody? Yeah. Peter, well, anything to add on, on that? From my perspective, I would like to avoid the use of shared space as a term completely. Um, mm. I think it's become toxic for a whole range of reasons, but I think the theme of accessibility in general terms is something that should permeate all our guidance documents and it will certainly yeah. permeate this one completely. Okay, um, there's a couple of um, questions from people um, asking around sort of um, key stakeholder consultees, one from John about um, road safety 
about Saucer. Um, yes, we're already talking to Saucer, John, about um, being a, a, a sort of key part of the um, sort of stakeholder engagement of that. Um, and then also Landscape Institute as well. Um, so, and we've already been in contact with, with Landscape Institute. So yes, it's, a, it's about finding the right place for those, those inputs to come in. Um, and, and we'll be doing a lot of work over that as we develop this, this next phase. Um, quite a few detailed comments around there's an interesting area, Sally, and you may not wish to go into this, but it's it's not one. There's a couple of questions and comments around, does this beg the question of whether manual for street should somehow be part of DMRB? Um, it is, yeah, I wouldn't. <laughs> uh, speaking personally, as I, I think I wouldn't want to get into too much detail around this, but I definitely think there's a case for, to, for, for trying to persuade HE that it, they should be referring designers to MFS for you know for uh the, the right kind for road roads under 40 mile an hour low speed roads definitely um because then that helps get rid of some of this ambiguity where where dmrb is giving design advice for 30 mile an hour roads and so on and so forth which is at odds with mfs but you know and of course as well this the status of dmrb has changed as well it used to be that you know there was some wording in it that said it is um it, uh, to, to the effect of uh, local authorities can use this if they if they think it's 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 appropriate. That wording's now gone. So, but actually haven't been very good at explaining that change. <clears throat> so I think there's a, a bit of a conversation we need to have with HE. And as Andrew said, there's uh, there was one of the recommendations from the policy lab work was around this. We need to have with them about how we clarify those relationships and, and so that they can make it clear to their designers for their roads, they need to be using manual for streets where it's appropriate. Um, which will also help signpost people who still go to DMRB to the right place as well. Yeah, yeah and there's a couple of sort of questions, sort of statements around um, the addressing the point about local authorities um, not using appropriate guidance and, and having a very clear statement that um, this new national guidance sort of um, should trump local guidance. So that presumably we'll manual for streets will need to address that issue with it in how it's presented yeah and i think i think the key point to remember is that there is it is still the local authority's duty to set its own design standards and obviously what we want them to do is is is, is adopt you know national good practice guidance like manual for streets in so doing um so yes i mean that's the framework we've we've always had and we've been working within for a very long time how we make sure that the guidance they go to is manual for streets when they are considering their own design standards and not DMRB or something else is, is, the, is the challenge. Okay, um, there's a specific question around highway widths. Um, will the road widths be reviewed as part of this exercise? Um, and um, manual streets reduce the width of roads from that shown in DB32. Feedback from local authorities is road widths are too narrow and are requested for road widths to be in increased particularly around refuse vehicles um, I mean clearly that's a, a key point but a, a sort of detail point so um, it's it's clearly something that will have to be considered during the approach any any thoughts Peter or Sally in that one um, I'm reminded of a slide that my friend Rob Cowan puts up occasionally where he says that you know in order to uh, to provide space for two parked cars, one on each side off the footway and uh, and a refuse wagon and a removal van and a fire engine, you need a carriageway that's something in the order of 10.5 metres wide. And that's clearly an extreme, but I don't, I think we will look at that, um, not not that particular issue, but we'll look at road widths in the context of, uh, of, of, of the project. Okay. Um, thanks to everybody who's submitted sort of questions. Um, there's there's lots of them and and, and lots of very so, sort of supportive. Um, there's a specific one around um, how the tender exercise will be carried out, um, which Peter outlined the two stage process. Um, we at the moment are just checking um, the requirements for how whether we need to go out through OJU to um, a completely open um, invitation to tender. Um, we're envisaging that that might not need to be the case, in which case the in, invitation to tender will be um, to as wide a spread of people as we can get via the CHT website. Um, 
um, our partners, etc. So um, what we'll do with the all the attendees on here is make sure that you've got um, when that is announced um, and where it is announced, it will be via a specific page on the website, which will send you details after this um, in um, webinar once the video is ready. Um, so that will be the, the place to, um, to sort of express interest. Um, but the ex once, once we've got that, that formal position, we'll, we'll communicate that out. Um, I'm just conscious of time. We've not got um, too much time left. I do want to end at two. Um, Peter, Sally, any particular areas that, that you'd want to make points on before we um, move to close down? Uh, uh, I've just spotted on. one. I've just spotted one question from Peter Jones, which is: Will this explicitly replace MFS and MFS2? Uh, yes, it will. It's going to combine, update, and supersede both of the, both of them, and probably just be known as Manual for Streets. Yeah, I was going to pick that one up as well. I saw Peter's comment there. Um, there's a lot of stuff uh, asking detailed questions about what are we going to include, what are we not going to include. I think the time will come when we'll go through those one by one with our appointed consultant and and pick all of that lot up um there's been quite a few questions about how do we persuade my local authority planning officers to utilize it because they don't they seem to think it's a, a highway uh, orientated document um I, my comment earlier on about having the ministry involved with the project i think is a reflection of our concern about that sort of thing Mm. And, uh, and similarly, our uh, determination to involve the planning inspectorate um, is also intended to address um, uh, address that sort of issue as well. But I don't want to pick up any on any of the detailed stuff, but there's quite a lot here at the moment. But in general terms, I think these questions are really, really useful for shaping what it is that we're, uh, we're going to try and do. Mm. So thank you, everybody, for that. Yeah, um, there's a specific question about the, what the budget is for this study. Um, probably not to go into in detail now, but that will, we will in the invitations tend to be um, outlining what the budget is, just so um, um, bidders can and tenderers can work within the constraints that we have got. Um, we have got constraints, and the, the department hasn't got a bottomless pit of money to to give us. We did try, but not, not quite. But we will. <laughs> We will be clear on what the budget is so that it's 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 clear what can be done within the um, framework that we have to work in but um, it's fair to say that it's it's not a um, an insubstantial sum so it's 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 been designed deliberately so we're able to do a uh, the consultant will be able to do a, a reasonable and proper job on this okay right i'm going to suggest we tie up now we've got two minutes left um, we've got one more poll left actually um, which i'd like to share of you and it again it's asking the audience um, about how you might like to get involved and again it's it's no it's not setting you to or committing you to anything this it's just to give a, a flavor of that so i'll launch that now and if you you'd like to answer that and be we'd be really grateful um, so how would you like to get involved? Would it be as a consultant, stakeholder, as an organisation, as an individual, or you might just be, want to be kept up to date on how things are progressing? Um, so if you'd like to do that, I can see those going. That's really good. Thank you very much. I'll keep it going a bit longer. We've um, got about three quarters of you have voted now. Okay, so we're getting up there. So we'll close that now and share it. Okay, so we've got a um, nice even split. So um, almost half just want to be kept up to date, which is of course perfectly reasonable. Um, um, healthy amount of consultant interest, um, stakeholder organizations and stakeholder individuals, all of that, that's excellent. Um, clearly, as I said at the start, we, we haven't got many developers in there, so we need to make sure that we get as wide a representation as possible. So we'll, we'll do quite a bit of work from that. So um, thank you for that. Um, OK, if I could just summarise by um, starting by thanking both Sally and Peter for their efforts today. So thank you both. Um, um, it's good that you're both um, sort of fully involved in this project to, to help us through it because we'll need a lot of help to get through it. Um, 
if you're not already um, clear, the recording will be available for both members and non-members on the website shortly. We'll send you a link to that. Um, as I said, we'll try to um, sort of um, summarise the questions and the answers that we're able to give at the moment, and we'll include that on the website as well. And just to remind you, there is a separate webinar around visibility, um, which we're holding on um, Friday lunchtime this week. Um, a similar format, we'll be talking about what it is that we're seeking to do. So please, if you haven't already registered um, and you're interested in that area, please do. And finally, thank you for attending. I hope you found it useful um, and look forward to engaging with you all as this moves forward. And once the webinar finishes in a moment, there will be a survey, which I'd be grateful if you could complete because it does help us just think about how we run these events. So. Without more ado, I will finish there and just say thank you very much to all of you and um, see you soon. Thank you.